Hey, hey, welcome everybody. We are in week, I think, uh, four of talking about casting vision and training believers. You guys know that's uh, one of the main things in terms of raising the sales for movements. And um, I want to throw out one. We've had a challenge with each of our series, like a couple months ago with prayer. We said we're going to do a four-hour prayer time. And with going out among the lost, we did a push week. Uh, we've not talked about this yet, but here's our, here's our hope. Because, right, the goal is obedience, not just that we, um, hey, learn some things and go, hey, that's great, but they're actually living it out, is that, hey, if you're a part of this, which you're here, so you're a part of this, hey, that you would have planned sometime in July. So you've got a, a stretch in there where you'd go, we're going to do uh, a training. And, and so you can really live out, you know, what we're talking about, casting vision. Hey, you can really can apply this. In fact, next week, you're going to get some the most applicable stuff we've ever done. Uh next next week um but so just want to um encourage you so schedule that somewhere where you can do a training and if you're going we do trainings all the time jim that's not really an action step for me great hey so train somebody up and then help them lead the training so all of us that's the step i need to take all of us hey in the next month hey be able to apply the stuff that we're talking about here um when chris originally asked hey talking about when we talk about casting vision and training believers uh, thinking about, hey, that in the United States, I immediately said, Chris, we got to call your friend Roy. Uh, I, you, most of us probably here on the call have read his book, Spent Matches. I read it years ago when I was just starting in the journey. And um, I'm mentoring and discipling some guys right now. And actually, that's the book we're reading this month. So uh, it's been fresh for me. And I'm like, wow, have I not read this for the last two years? Um, but, but in terms of casting vision, and, and Roy's been a, a mentor from afar for me, in terms of taking my church and hey, how to um, how to cast vision to people with congregation and finding the people you not the people I'd most likely find to get excited about making a disciple movement. So um, I got an email from Roy, probably with thousands of other people, but it said in the last twenty years, I mean, there's hundreds or thousands of uh, of of uh, groups and churches and movements that hundreds of movements that have started from his ministry. So. Uh, I think that's it, Roy. You ready to roll and, and, and share with us today? Sure. <clears throat> yeah, that that those movement figures are with new generations, not me. So don't 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 attribute new, new generations. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Yeah, they they taught me. I didn't teach them. So uh, they're my mentors. So well, where are we going, Jim? You were talking beach before we got started here. So I was thinking I'd like to go to the beach. So yeah. Yeah, we so we've just been talking about casting vision. Uh, okay. specifically and hey how do you, hey how do you do that what have you found to be most effective specifically sure. you know you're in a case of leading a uh traditional church and doing dmm hey, what yeah what what have you learned along the way and then we'd love after you share we'll do some q a okay. um, of uh you know questions we have okay I, I think um you know my my first five years i i was operating under the wrong assumption uh, the assumption was it was a training problem. I just needed to provide a uh, different training for these uh, followers of Christ and they would move in, in, in different directions. And then I realized that it really wasn't a training problem. It was a culture problem. Uh, culture being defined by uh, language and customs or sets of habits that are repeated on a, a regular basis. And uh, I realized that even though I existed in a, a, a local fellowship that was, um, was really focused on reaching lost people. We came out of the Willow Creek model. Uh, we were, you know, we were seeker obsessed, not just seeker sensitive or seeker focused and stuff like that. We didn't have, um, we don't do, and still don't do musical worship on Sunday morning. It's all focused on, you know, attracting lost people so that 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 was kind of our our vibe and so um i, I figured that hey that's uh that we're, we're focused on lost people but i didn't realize that the custom or, or or let's just say the language that we had built was a language of invitation um and and so people uh the medium that they had grown up in as uh new believers new followers of jesus and stuff was this this language of invitation um and so they were to, you know, in, in Andy Stanley's words, invest and invite. Uh, and that was, 
uh, what, what they had heard and, and what they were used to. And that was the pathway that they knew. Um, and now I was telling them something different. I was saying, no, we need to plant the gospel uh, where you live, learn, work, and play. It needs to move away from us. And, uh, you know, we can't fit everybody here. We're never going to move the needle on the Great Commission in, uh, in this county, much less the city or much the state, uh, by inviting people here. And so I, I changed the rules and, and I actually realized I was changing the culture. And so I had to approach it in a different way and realize that there was a period of mindset shifts that had to take place in people's minds. And so I had to provide experiences for them to change their mind. Um, and, and recently, I think I've, I've stumbled upon some language that's really helped me in this regard. And, and that is that to redo the narrative of the gospel. Uh, the narrative of the gospel that, that most people have is, is kind of a, a gospel of rescue. Um, and, and, and we've kind of retooled that a little bit to come back and say, no, it, it's really what we're about is just doing what God has always been about. What is, what is the triumph God always wanted? And they, the triumph God has always wanted a family. Um, the, the reason we were created was that uh, the triumph God at the core, uh, you know, if you most of you probably had systematic theology at some point or another, and, and you've, uh, you know, read uh, a uh, prolegomena on theology proper, and you've seen the arguments that come from one theological persuasion or another about, you know, what sits at the core of the, in, uh, of the communicable attributes of God, you know, is it love, is it glory? And I'd like to suggest that um, someone needs to write a new systematic theology that, that says that at the heart of God, the, the communicable attribute that sits at the core of, of the triune God is generosity. And, and they wanted to give away the relationship that they had with one another uh, to someone else. And it was the, the only way that the, the triune God could expand or, or share um, what they were experiencing. So that they wanted a family. And so, you know, the, the narrative of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is about God creating a family, starting with Adam and Eve. And, and that was an unsuccessful moment in, in the creation of that family. And then with Abraham and, and then with Jesus and now and now the ecclesia, the called out ones, the church. Uh, and so this whole narrative has always been about God wanting to create a family. And so um, the opportunity that you and I have in this process of, of being a part of the family is to uh, help find those not yet family members that, that aren't here, that, that need to be here. And uh, I use the illustration a lot about once my, uh, my oldest son, um, who is a bit of an agitator, uh, even in his early days, uh, found a hollow spot in one of those uh, carousels that held T-shirts and clothes in a department store. He realized that in the center, it was hollow. And he was about five or six. And it, it was a perfect space for him to, uh, to rest, I guess, or hide or whatever. And so he found his way in there. And of course, you know, his parents um, are looking around and, you know, the, the fear that goes through a parent when they realize they've lost a child, you know, it's like, I can't find them. Where are they? Um, and, you know, the, the, you want to, you know, scream code blue and lock the doors and figure out, you know, where this kid's at. And, and really nothing else matters in that parent's life when that, that child is lost uh, until you find that kid. And, I think that's the heart of our father. When Jesus says uh, that he looked upon the, the, the multitudes like the sheep without a shepherd, they were helpless and harassed. Um, it, it's that heart. It's that, that fear that, that they aren't in the family. They're lost and they need to be back into, into the safety and security of the family. That's how God looks at you know, those not yet children that are out there. Um, and that's the heart that he has for them. And so we've really tried to redo the narrative with people to understand that this is this is about building a family. And you just sit in a long line of a family building. And, and so that's what that's how God has, has called you into the family to help build that family. And here are some tools. Uh, here's how to 
invite people in to learn how to read the Bible for themselves, uh, learn how to, to change their relationship with this creator God, to be a father God, and, and begin to understand your identity as a child of God in that process. So, you know, that redoing the narrative, you know, it has helped us then rebuild a culture that is really focused on multiplication you know, rather than a, addition. So that's, that's kind of sort of like the current thinking, you know, where we're at right now and in, in that process. Um, and, um, you know, just beginning to understand that, that people have these mindset shifts um, and, and you've got to attack those and help them break them down. I, I think that uh, it, I, I don't know what the vocation of most of you on this screen are, but I'm guessing many of us, uh, we, we uh, I see many friends out there. So I, I know some of you and I, I know that uh, we make our living, um, you know, working as, as a Christian uh, in some form of capacity. And so, uh, oftentimes, uh, when we begin to work with people, I find that a lot of people uh, don't have the grace for the people they're working with that God had with them. Most of us microwaved ourselves. Uh, most of us, um, excuse me a second, sorry about that. Most, most of us were crock-potted to where we are. We read a book and this, and a conversation, an article, saw a video, uh, had you know, a bunch of conversations, and slowly but surely over time, our mindset shifts, you know, changed, and we realized that, that God was into multiplication and not addition. That that the forms of church that we had accepted as as normal um, in the West uh, were not actually biblical. They weren't necessarily anti-biblical by any means, but they weren't necessarily normative uh, biblical experience. And there might be a different way of of gospeling. And so, as we were crock potted to this space, we we now come to to be able to have some language and, and we have training and we have all this, this, this kind of, of uh, culture that we want to build. And so we start working with people and, and we want to put them in a microwave, you know, and we hit, you know, I've got a little button on my microwave. It's the only button. I've got this really fancy microwave. I'm sure, you know, it will launch rockets into space if I know how to do it, but there's only one button on that microwave that I use and it's micro express. It gives me 30 seconds. And so I hit it once and I can turn a dial and get six minutes if I want. That's the only one I use. Uh, but I, I want to, you know, I get people, I want the, them to move faster in this process than I move. And, uh, and, and they don't have the, the experience. They haven't read as much. They haven't experienced as much. They, they just don't have what, what you and I have in this process. And so the, the need to, to realize that I've got to provide space for them to, to be in a crock pot, to slowly come to those understandings and, and, and decisions about you know, why things aren't working. Uh, and, you know, average, the average follower of Christ today has no clue as to how bad the statistics are. It's why I put that first chapter in spit matches, um, which is really old by now. Um, I, sh I should see if Thomas Nelson wanted to do a new edition because there's even much more damning statistics out now post COVID um, than there were then. But the average you know, follower of Jesus does not realize how bad it is. Um, I don't know if, if you all saw the, the survey that came out the other day, you know, George Barna is not at Barna anymore. He, he's at another space and he's at a, Christian college you know, doing research now. And, and he's been doing a research project um, with some Christian organizations on uh, worldview. And, and it was this, the, the, the worldview has this eight tenets to it. So it's, uh, there is moral absolute truth. That truth is found in the Bible. Um, you can't earn your, your relationship with God. It's a gift. And just some, some basic tenets, you know, not, not really out there at all. Just some eight basic things. And, and his research um, is, is suggesting um, that only 6% you know, of Americans hold any kind of, of worldview that's, that's Christian. But when he goes on, which I, I don't quite get this yet, I'm still digging into what he's saying, but um, he, he suggests that only 9% of the people who attend church 
hold to those eight tenets in that that would be a distinctly sort of evangelical, you know, orthodox view uh, of the world. So, you know, oftentimes many of the people that we're working with, um, we might just uh, overshoot our presumptions of, of where they are in their own spiritual journey. Uh, and so the raw material that we have to work with in the average church um, might be a heck of a lot smaller than we really think. Because if, if, if you took those eight tenets and you started asking people, you know, if they, they bought into those, um, you really have to kind of buy into those eight tenets to really have a foundation to push off to say, you know, my neighbors are lost and, and, and facing a crisis eternity. And if I don't do something about it, um, you know, there's this, it would be unconscionable. Um, they, they don't necessarily believe that. And so we're trying to get them to move, to move the gospel down the street or across the cubicle or wherever. And uh, the fact is, is that uh, they probably need a re-gospeling themselves before they can be converted into a multiplication mentality. So I'll stop there. Jim, you got any, any questions or anybody want to ask about any I got of that? one specific question, Roy, that I, you've helped me a lot with in talking about casting vision from the front of the room versus casting vision from the back of the room. Mm -hmm. Would you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, you know, for those of us who have existed in, um, in an institutional church, you know, we have forever uh, attempted to steer the ship from the front of the room, you know, the platform, uh, Sunday morning, uh, the announcement time, the bulletin, uh, and now, you know, all the channels that we might have to communicate in our Facebook page, our uh, email, um, global emails, our app, our push notifications on our app, all that kind of stuff. You know, we feel like we can, we can move the, the needle in, in that way. But the reality is, um, I think if we take a deep breath and, and, and be honest about it, uh, we really don't move the needle hardly at all that way. Um, and so this is not a marketing strategy. You know, you, know, you can't market disciple making movements tactics. Um, it, it really is more of a terrorist type activity. So you have to work the edges of the room, find out those people who are wholly dissatisfied and, and begin to work with them. You know, that's how terrorists work. You know, they don't work in, in the public square. You know, they, they work on the edges of disenfranchised people and they take those disenfranchised people. And if you've ever, you know, read any, anything, um, you know, by, uh, uh, Frank, I forget his last name, he goes by two of them, but he, he talks about the different, you know, they move people from a uh, sort of, a, a, there's a Facebook post and you make a comment and they invite you over into this forum and, and here there's some stuff and then they invite you over here and they invite you over here. And, you know, in five months, you know, you find yourself in, in Syria, you know, as a, as a fighter for stuff and you're an 18 year old kid in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, and it, that's, that's how they work on the edges. And, and that's why they're so successful at that. And we oftentimes think we can market this by, you know, coming up announcements, you know, pushing, using, you know, whatever pull that we might have. And it's really more of a, a slow uh, private conversation, planting a garden, uh, you know, finding those, those and, uh, persons of peace. I don't think that's, I, I, I use that sparingly, but, but you find these, these, believers who are wholly discontent and believe that the church uh, could in fact uh, should in fact be doing so much more and but they've never had uh, they've always been playing in this aquarium that we've been in they've never had another opportunity to see that that they could go someplace else do something else that they could actually be a church planter um, that you know they've they've never been given that opportunity and so it's, uh, it's much less out front and vocal and three color brochure stuff than it is just private backroom conversations, uh, planting seeds. Um, I don't know how many miraculous movement books, cases of miraculous movements books I've given out. Um, and, you know, in the back in you know, 12 years ago, well, it might have been, but uh, when Jerry came out with that book, um, you know, it, it was. Uh, 
uh, heaven sent for me to be able to have a tool to put in people's hands, just let them read and see, does it light them up? You know, do they, do they come ask questions and wow, that'd be fascinating, you know, and to ask the question, do you think that could happen here? Um, so planting seeds, working the back of the room, you know, is, is far more important than using, wasting energy, you know, trying to market people into a, a DMM approach. That's super helpful. I, yeah, I felt like I, when I started the journey of trying to transition our church, um, I thought, Hey, everyone's just going to get excited about this. And, uh, <laughs> but really the behind the scenes conversations is where everything happened. I have one more specific question, just as, as, as I've learned from you sure. and then, and then let's open it up for everybody. Um, it would just be, um, it sometimes feels like a fine line between, hey, casting vision to be a part of disciple-making movements and just ripping on the traditional church. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt like you've done a really good job of someone who's not just negative, Chris does a great job of this too, but of a balance of, of affirming what's going on at the same time, asking, is there something more? Um, and uh, my guess is all of us have gotten in conversations where we've gone, man, the person maybe walked away, feel like I just trashed the church. And now, and now, now I'm known as the guy who trashes the church. And so what are some things you've, you've learned along the way of, of walking that balance of cast and vision and at the same time, you know, celebrating what God's doing now too? Well, in my early days, I didn't have a balance. I was just burning the church down, you know. Um, so um, fortunately, I, I, I think I've gotten over that um, and uh, with the realization you know, um, I, when I talk about the, the legacy church, you know, I, I talk about it in, not in terms that it fails, but it's, it's just moderately effective. Um, you know, we, we have seen hundreds of people come to faith at Shoal Creek. I've got pictures. I got two, two pictures of these tiny little pictures made up of the hundreds of people you know, up until say 2014 or wherever we were when we were um, 2050, I think when we were 25 years old, um, you know, so it, it's effective um, at, at adding people to the kingdom. Um, but when you look at what needs to be done, uh, I think that, you know, begins to, to show that it will not be the only thing that achieves the Great Commission. In fact, Without something else, what we know as the local fellowships that exist in, in communities will not achieve the Great Commission. And I think you know, history proves that out. Um, so I, I think you, know, you have to talk about you know, what needs to be done, what's the task ahead of us, uh, what's the gap that, that we're looking at, um, and, and those types of things, you know, rather than just turning around and spraying uh you know negativity across the existing you know local fellowships that exist and uh you know and, and as you all know maybe you've been there you know you're just doing you're they're just trying to do the best they can all that's all they know um and it, it's it's just a game that everyone's been taught and you're coming along changing the rules um and so you just have to be patient and graceful you know in that process and um help them understand that uh, there might be a different way. Um, you know, I, I, I use passages in the scripture that are helpful. You know, um, I have people that, you know, well, what about me? How do I get fed? Where do I go to, you know, uh, this kind of stuff? I said, well, you know, there's this guy that Jesus heals um, and, uh, and he tries to get in the boat with Jesus. And, and Jesus says, no, you can't get at the boat. You can't sit at my feet. You know, you can't take my five fundamentals of the face course. You know, you can't take my follow-up course. I'm not going to teach you the, the, uh, the, the, the hand and how to pray using your hand and all that kind of stuff. So I want you to go back to where you came from and tell them what's happened to you. And it's like, that's counter to everything that we know uh, in, in local church type ministry. We would never release someone immediately to go back and tell the story without sending someone with them, without making sure that they were somehow qualified, certified, uh, uh, and, and able to do that. 
and, and just ask the question, why, why does Jesus do things differently than we're doing them right now? Um, and, you know, I think that if, if we could learn to um, make sure that instead of tell people what they ought to think, we ought to suggest what they should be thinking about. And, and by doing that, you kind of put splinters in their brain and, and you begin to create the kind of agitation that they can respond to themselves because you want them to come you know, to their own conclusions. You, you don't want to give them conclusions. Um, so, you know, just, I think just being, being graceful um, in that process and uh, keeping your eyes on the gap you know, rather than pointing at the, the ineffectiveness of the church, I, I think it's, it's moderately effective, but it's, uh, it's not ineffective because, you know, many of us owe our eternal destinations um, to a local fellowship. Um, and, and so we need to be mindful of that, that, that people look at that. And Harry Brown, one of my mentors, is com- always says, you know, it, uh, uh, that that people, <clears throat> what they're one with is what they're one to. So many of the people that we're working with are trying to convince to join us in this multiplicative strategy. We're one to Christ through some type of local church ministry. And so what they're one with is what they're one to. They're very loyal to that. And so we have to make sure that uh, we honor that, but yet we point out the fact that it will not be um, that which helps us reach the great commission in my lifetime, at least. So that's super helpful. Thank you so much. Hey guys, we got about another 15 minutes or so. So unmute yourself and uh, let's, let's ask some more questions. Hey Roy, I've got a question for you. Thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate uh, your wisdom. Hey, thinking of the stream of like habits equal our life. If you are thinking of discipleship habits, to create the slow growth that you're talking about. What are a couple that you see even after you've trained and you have people following that we avoid and what could we do about that to help people not avoid those habits, those discipleship habits? What do they avoid? Like, are there a couple areas, like when you think of the different habits that create disciple making movements that need to be a part of the DNA of our life, but in our American culture, because of maybe the, the uh, environments we've grown out on, we avoid some discipleship habits like the plague. Mm -hmm. How could we help people in those areas? And what are a couple that you see that? Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't think people avoid, I, I think about it in terms of, 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 the, of a, a paradigm or a, a rubric um, that, that we've developed, you know, at New Generations called the Habits of a Multiplying Disciple. And in, in the center of that is the heart of the Father. Um, I'm not sure that, that people do lean into the heart of the Father uh, as often and as regularly uh, as they need to. To, to get his heart in their eyes so that they see their world the way he sees them. And so, you know, as I push with people, I push them into the heart of the father, you know, to understand what's happening in Luke 15, you know, when the father sees the son from afar off, what does that mean? Um, you know, that, that, that just happened. Did he just, you know, win the lottery that day and come out on the road to find that his idiot son who stole half of, of his hard earned wealth and went off and wasted it. Um, that he just happened to hit the lottery and pick the right day to come out on the road? Uh, or was that father consistently out looking on the horizon for his son to come home? Is that, that's the longing of the father's heart. And so I keep, I, I love to push people into that to understand that their father has longed for them to come home. And just as he longs for them to come home, he's longing for his not yet other children to come home as well. And, and he's given you the great privilege of, of being able to escort them, you know, back home and into the family where they belong. Um, I think that on the negative side, uh, one of the chief rival gods in our culture is time. And, and so when we uh, ask people to engage with lost people, um, I keep this um, 
uh, I don't know if you guys can see it because I have my little background on here, but uh, I've, I've got some uh, some uh, Lego blocks uh, I keep on my desk and I use them, you know, quite frequently to help people understand that uh, when I engage the average follower of Christ, uh, typically all of the the six or eight blocks, you know, the, the blocks are on top of one another, they're, they're even. And it's like, OK, what this is going to mean to get serious about living out the Great Commission and living out the Father's heart in your world is removing some of the relationships that you already have because you're spending all your time with Christians. You've now got to figure out how do I find a, a, a channel to relate to the non-believing world? And so pick who you want to unfriend and unfriend them. You don't have to do it mean or nasty or that kind of stuff. I, I don't know if you guys have ever read a book, uh, Jim Peterson, Lifestyle Evangelism. It's a great navigator guy. But when Jim moved back to Colorado Springs, uh, some of his buddies at in the navigators uh, that lived you know, at the Glen there and worked at the Glen together, they got excited. Now we can play tennis together. And Jim says, oh, guys, I, I hate to tell you this, but I don't play tennis with, with Christians. It was like his way of saying, you know, this is one area of my life that I can engage with a non-believing world. So I, I don't play tennis with Christians. Um, and I think we have to help people begin to live out that kind of thinking. What do they do? Where do they go uh, that puts them in the path of the non-believing world? And because time is a chief rival God and so many people are so addicted to their family uh, that, that their, their, their kids are like idols in their lives. And, and so as a result, um, you know, everything revolves is kid centric. Everything revolves around a kid. And um, and so I, I try to help them to say, OK, um, you, you've you've you're invested thousands of dollars to put your son on a traveling baseball team. Well, let's go plant the gospel there because you're with those people all the time. And 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 you need to understand how, you know, how can we do this? How can we make this a, a church, you know? Um, that, that travels <laughs> every weekend, you know, because it's addicted to baseball, you know, so it, it's, it's that kind of thinking that's hard to get people into because they're so uh, into their own world. Um, so I, I think that's, that's a difficulty. I, I think another one is, um, you know, um, the, Dave Heidenreich, friend of our mine and, and Chris, as some of you might know, Dave, uh, Dave calls this the golden question. And that's a question of inviting people to a discovery group, getting people over the fact that that people think bad about the Bible. Uh, they don't want to read the Bible. They don't want to you know, get into a discovery group or that kind of stuff um, and, and helping them change their thinking about that, that that American Bible Society every year does a study. Of, of Americans, and, and they find that 67% of, of Americans would like to know more about the Bible. Uh, the problem is, is, is they're not afraid of the Bible, they're not afraid of God, they're not afraid of Jesus, they're afraid of us. And, and so, you know, we, we've got to get used to asking that golden question, hey, would you like to read the Bible with me and discover what God has to say about life? Um, and, and getting them, you know, to get on the bike, learn to ride that bike and, and get rejected. That's fine. You know, but just keep asking that question, discover that there are persons of peace out there and, and where they live, learn, work and play who do want to know God better. Um, there's a, a guy named Sanford who works in uh, the mountains of Tennessee in Asheville, North Carolina. And uh, uh, Sanford started doing the prayer calendar. So, you know, 30 days, names of people, Take 10 people and uh, 10 of those people uh, that you are not sure about the eternal destination. So and so one of them was his neighbor um, across the in the back. And so Sanford on the day that neighbor, a uh, text the neighbor and he said, hey, uh, I started a new habit of praying for my my friends. And today I have your name on to pray for. And I'm wondering if you could uh, just tell me, uh, is there something I could pray for you about today? So he says, wow, that's a deep question, Sanford. I'm going to have to think about that. I'll get back to you. And so he thought that was a brush off. And he thought that, oh, geez, I, I just blew it with this neighbor. You know, so four or five, six days later, he gets a text back from this neighbor. And the neighbor says, uh, Sanford, I thought about that question. And, and here's what you could pray for me about. 
He said, I think I, I need to figure out what it means to be more spiritual. And if you could pray for me about that. And so it's like, holy smokes. And so he uh, takes the opportunity next time he sees the neighbor out, um, you know, a couple of days later, he goes back across the fence and he says, man, that was fascinating. Uh, I, I, I prayed for you, you know, and stuff. And he says, uh, where's that coming from? What's, what's going on? And he, and he guys sort of explained it to him and stuff. And so Sanford just sort of sucks it up and says, you know, Hey, would you be interested in reading the Bible and discovering what God has to say about life? And the guy says, man, that's what I've been looking for. <laughs> and all the time, you know, inside Sanford's wondering, Oh, geez, I don't know about this. You know, should we ask this question? Not, nah, you know, that kind of stuff, just a lot of negativity going on there. Right? And, and it's, it's, it's satanic. Uh, I mean, it, it's the root of what Satan does to us is convince us of, of things that are untrue. And, and when he asked the golden question, you know, people were interested. So I think, you know, getting people, you know, to believe what you're talking about in terms of multiplication is, is just to really get them to, to ask the question. Um, the very first discovery group that we ever had at Shoal Creek was a gal um, who, who lives in a, a really nice upper, upper middle class neighborhood. And, um, you know, everything's all brushed kind of a, you know, everything's really fine there, you know? So she was afraid and, and all, all she could think about, she has kind of a negative personality anyway. And so all she could think about was people rejecting her. And, uh, but, but, you know, the spirit of God, the great hound of heaven would not leave her alone and just kept pressing down into her. Sue, just ask the question, just go ask. And so she, one day she had had enough, you know, she had that Popeye moment, couldn't stand it anymore. She got up and, and went out on the street, door to door down to her neighbors. And, uh, and she started asking him, Hey, uh, I, I'm starting a group. We're going to read the Bible and discover what God has to say about life. You know, I wonder if you'd be interested and inside it, she'd already turned away and started walking away because she knew the answer was going to be no six out of the seven women said yes. Um, and, and absolutely blew her away, um, that, that they would be interested, you know, in, in that kind of activity. So, getting people through that idea that even though we live in a cancel culture, you know, we, we, we live in this me too world. We live in this black Lives matter world. We live in all this, this, the, the stuff, you know, the racial injustice that's going on, all this kind of stuff, you know, it's like, it still is a world that needs Jesus and it's still a world that was made in the image of God. And there's the spirit of God pulling people into the family of God and getting us, you know, getting our folks to, to believe uh, that, that God is who he says he is, and he is doing what he says he said he would do. And we just need to join him there and, and begin to invite people into those environments uh, to see what God wants to do with them. So uh, I, I think those are kind of the, you know, if I think back to it, you know, pushing them to the heart of God, uh, getting them to, to give up their time and get in the way of, of the non-believing world and to, and to ask the question, you know, ask start asking people to read the Bible together with them and discover what God has to say about life. Um, Roy, this is Ron English uh, hey, Ron. In, Waco, in Waco, Texas. Thank you again for being on here sharing uh, this wisdom with us. Um, based on what you were just talking about, um, it brought to mind the fact that when I go into environments uh, especially in the African-American community and people around here, I've been around here long enough, people know that I'm a pastor. Yeah. Um, and it seems to be a detriment <laughs> when I'm trying to bring up <laughs> things about Christ because now it's this, this attitude of, like if I'm in Sunday school class, like I don't attend a lot of the classes, I set them up. But if I'm in the class, the minute I say something, it kills all of the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I found that when me uh, and Grace uh, Lucas, like when we go out among the lost, we're still trying to figure all of that out, but it's so much easier because no one we meet know we're pastors. <laughs> um, and so is, do you have some, you know, some, some kind of experience advice for that? I mean, I know we're sharing the word of God, mm -hmm. you know, part of me says, well, just go do it anyway uh, and all of that. But are there some, little key pieces or something that we can do to kind of overcome this piece. Well, he's a pastor. He's going to say that anyway, kind of, you know, dismiss it because I'm a pastor. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, I, I really do um, think, you know, for those of us who are vocationally employed as, as uh, you know, staff members in churches, uh, we, we have a, we start one down in that, that process. Um, it's, it's because that's what we're supposed to say, what we're supposed to do. And I think you have to realize that. So um, when you're tr- trying to, you know, attract people to follow you into a, um, a multiplicative disciple making strategy, you have to realize that that persuasion may not be my best strategy because that's what they expect from me and they're built to resist me. And, and so persuading them and the, and the power that goes into my persuasion uh, may be a negative thing. And, and so you may have to be a bit more passive aggressive in this process. Um, and so, you know, uh, the way I, I look at it, you know, is, is I like to, you know, use questions. Uh, I like to use resources to, to put into people's hands um, to help them, you know, take a look at things and, and understand, you know, what's going on. Um, I, I try to be indirect rather than direct when working in the Christian community, but uh, because they they just expect me to to be after them for their time and their money, um, and, and and so you just have to develop a posture um, that that's not persuasive, but yet. You know, you, you do have an agenda that you would like them, you know, to pay attention to. Um, I, I think even in the non-believing world, Ron, uh, you'll discover that when people find out what you do, like you're leading a discovery group and, and they know that you're a pastor. And, and so someone has a question uh, about a particular passage. And, you know, if, and, you, you know, if you've been through, you know, good discovery training, you know that you, you really don't want to answer that question. You want to let the text be the expert here, not me. And so you're going to redirect them to the text and you're going to redirect the question to the group. Um, you kind of break a social contract because they know you're a pastor, you're trained, you're equipped, you've got all this knowledge and stuff. And what you're telling them is I ask you a direct question and you're refusing to answer it. And, and so. One of the problems for many of us that when people know that we're in, um, you know, a professional Christian situation, we're probably never going to be really great discovery group leaders. It's just a fact. And so you have to realize that you're an outside leader and, and an inside leader, an inside untrained leader is always way more effective than an outside trained leader. And so the hat that you may have to wear quickly, you know, in your movement activity is a coaching hat, is a, is a Barnabas type of hat, you know, r- rather than a Paul type of hat. And, and, and for many of us, that's a hard pill to swallow because we want to be there on the front line. We want to sit on the edge of eternity and we want to watch people into the kingdom. But the fact is, is that unfortunately, the way the way our world's wired, um, it's it's difficult for for that to happen um, in, in a discovery process because we're trained and we, we you you know the answer, but you're refusing to give it. Um, but you're right. Out amongst the lost, it's um, you know, it's so much ref- so much more refreshing. Um, and, um, you know, it's just, it's just more fun. Roy, you talked about uh, the problem of, of time and talked about being addicted to family and talked about little league baseball and stuff like that. And you've, I know you've observed a lot of movement leaders and people who are on fire. What does, what does their life look like? Is, is it the, you know, the American dream of a balanced life? But I mean, you understand my question, what does their life look like? Yeah, um, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't believe right now that we have any movements in the U.S. that would be classically, would fit the classic definition. So it's hard to see any Western leaders, you know, in that regard. So I, I can answer this from, uh, say, an Eastern African 
you know, perspective and, and watching an Isla Tassi and, and his leadership team, John Deba, um, guys like that. Um, I mean, th their life um, is, is really given to this. Uh, um, they are consumed with, with seeing the gospel move. Um, and like, let, let's take Isla as an example. Um, here's a guy, you know, leads a big, you know, one of the, the few movement leaders in the world that have cascading movements, all right? So we're talking about movements that create movements that create movements. So there's multiplication, not at the disciple level, not at the church, just at the church level, uh, but there's movement at, there's multiplication at the movement level as well. Um, so uh, Isla's building uh, a half, another piece to a leader, a center that they have in Nairobi there. And um, he goes out at lunch um, and sits with the construction workers and, and ultimately uh, is able to gather them into a discovery group at lunch. And that discovery group uh, actually multiplies. It, it, it takes on their families. It takes on uh, parts of their community and, and, and then ultimately becomes a church. And so, um, Isla could have eaten lunch with his staff. Isla could have eaten lunch, you know, by himself. He could have been on his phone returning emails. He could have done a lot of other things, but, but his life, you know, he, he saw an opportunity and it's, it's part of, I think for us, um, as you start to see, um, people follow you into this thing and you start to see them multiply and you, and you begin to get the, the beginnings of a movement. Uh, there's a tension that exists in our lives as leaders between um, moving into the lost and 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 motivating, encouraging, training, and coaching the found, and and that tension is is never a balance. It's always a tension. It's always going to be there, um, and and you you just have to live with that tension that with the heart for lost people, but yet you're building an army. To reach them and and so for isla you know he, he probably spends 85 to 90 percent of his day with the found uh, coaching equipping you know leading and that kind of stuff but he saw a, a single moment in his day where there were lost people and he went toward them so i i think that's what characterizes the life of a movement leader um, is is that kind of of opportunity always with eyes up eyes out and the heart of the father is in those eyes and so when you see you know opportunities to engage with those who are far from god you take them uh, but at the same time you're, you're still you know back recruiting training equipping coaching you know getting people equipped to be movement warriors with you you know in this process as well but that that tension always remains i don't think it ever leaves us I don't know if that helps Gary or not, but. Roy, this has been fantastic. We, uh, we spend the last 30, 40 minutes breaking into groups and uh, keeping okay. each other accountable and sharing what we're going to do based on what you just said. So you've given us a lot to, to think about and apply. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for, for joining us. And uh, um, yeah, we're going to now break into groups.